Exploring the Hellraiser franchise, presented by Tabato Vision, Pinhead, a character history, as depicted within the Hellraiser films, Part 1, Hellraiser, and, Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. Pinhead, designated the Hell Priest, is the main antagonist of the Hellraiser series. He is the most famous Cenobite, and is Leviathan's favorite Cenobite out of Hell's entire army, because of his understanding of Hell's laws, and his ability to understand Leviathan's frame of mind. Pinhead, was once a human known as Elliot Spencer, who was born in 1887 in Victorian-era Britain. As a young adult, he would join the British Army and later serve in France during World War I, as a captain in the British Expeditionary Force. He was a charismatic and eloquent man, who could feel great empathy and compassion for those around him. However, after participating in one of the battles of Flanders, he loses his faith in humanity after witnessing the atrocities enacted upon one another. He also loses his faith in God, whom he believed failed mankind. Captain Spencer did not believe he had the right to live after watching so many of his comrades perish in such horrific circumstances. Suffering from the severe effects of post-traumatic stress disorder, the disillusioned and jaded Spencer wandered the earth, indulging in a hedonistic lifestyle, turning to the baser methods of gratification for satisfaction and pleasure. Sometime during the year 1921, Captain Spencer traveled to British India, where he discovered the lament configuration and bought it from its current guardian. Solving the box inside his tent, Spencer was immediately impaled by hooked chains that exploded outward from the box itself. He was dragged into the labyrinth and aggressively transformed into the Cenobite we would later come to know as Pinhead. In the decades that followed, he obediently served the dark entity known as the Leviathan, and was designated the new leader of the Cenobite faction known as the Order of the Gash, losing all memory of his past life as a human being in the process. Hellraiser During the events of Hellraiser, Pinhead makes his first appearance as a shadowy figure that appears after Frank Cotton, having solved the lament configuration in his attic, is torn apart by similar ethereal chains that erupted from the box upon its completion, not unlike those that aided in Pinhead's original transformation decades prior. Pinhead retrieves the puzzle box from the floor, and uses it to teleport himself, his Cenobite entourage, and Frank's mutilated remains back to Hell's Labyrinth, with the attic appearing as if nothing had ever taken place at all. Some time later, when Frank's brother Larry begins to move into the house with his wife Julia, Larry, having accidentally cut himself while moving a piece of furniture in the attic, spills droplets of blood onto the floor, the same stretch of flooring where Frank had previously met his demise. The blood kickstarted a supernatural process in the attic, an event which somehow allowed Frank to reconstruct his body, organ by organ, bone by bone, and return to the world of the living as a skinless, blood-covered escapee of hell. In the week that followed, Frank had convinced Julia, Larry's cheating wife whom he was having an affair with, to aid him in his continued regeneration by luring sacrifices to the home, where Frank would attack, kill, and drain them of their blood and fluids. It was during this period of time that Frank began fearing the return of the Cenobites, and he grew more and more paranoid of this looming threat. The Order of the Gash, would never stop looking for Frank should they ever realize he had escaped from hell, and Frank was well aware of this, and most likely very aware of the punishment that awaited him back in hell, should he ever be found. Some time later, after a violent confrontation with a skinless Frank and Larry's daughter, Kirsty, Frank's niece, who he has apparently behaved inappropriately toward in the past, steals the puzzle box from Frank, easily solves it, and, in doing so, summons the Order of the Gash. As the cult prepares to take Christy to the labyrinth, she convinces them to exchange her soul for Frank's, to which they seemingly accept, but only as long as Frank himself confesses to having escaped their world. Pinhead is left somewhat skeptical and threatens to cruelly punish Kirsty should she attempt to fool them. In the end, Pinhead does indeed rip Frank to pieces, resulting in Frank's ethereal expulsion from the world of the living, for the second time. Despite their earlier agreement, the Cenobites, Chatterer, Butterball, and the female Cenobite, chase after Kirsty, with Pinhead seemingly showing great interest in sending her to the labyrinth, 
even though she had kept her end of the bargain in delivering Frank to them. This was most likely due to an understanding between both parties, because when the Cenobites reappeared, after Kirsty came across the skinned body of her father, whom she assumed was Frank, Pinhead asks, where is the man who did this, and she replied with, he's my father, you can't have him. Kirsty mistakenly thought the skinless body was Frank's, and that her father had killed him, and, judging by her response, Pinhead and the Cenobites now believed Kirsty was protecting Frank. At this point, they most likely presumed the deal was off and went after her, even though they eventually succeeded in getting Frank anyways. However, Kirsty successfully manages to utilize the lament configuration, sending the gash back to hell once again. Hellbound, Hellraiser 2 As the story of Hellraiser 2 opens, Pinhead's former life as a human, is briefly shown, showcasing Spencer solving the puzzle box, and leading to his aforementioned transformation into a Cenobite. The story then returns to the present, where the events seen in Hellraiser 1, have just happened. Kirsty is now in police custody, but has been temporarily placed in the Channard Institute for further psychiatric evaluations, due to her wild recollection of the events of Hellraiser 1. She soon thereafter begins having visions of a skinless man asking her for help, a man she at first believes to be her father, trapped in hell and somehow communicating with her. The story's main antagonist, the psychotic psychiatrist Dr. Philip Channard, who runs the hospital Kirsty now resides in, is actually someone very familiar with Hell's puzzle boxes, and upon hearing Kirsty's recollection of previous events, as well as being warned by her to stay away from the mattress, the same mattress we see Julia's grizzled corpse on at the end of the first film, Channard believes he may finally be able to get the answers to the questions he's always had. Does Hell exist? Are the boxes really gateways? And the ultimate question. Why? Upon retrieving the mattress and tricking a disturbed patient into cutting himself while sitting on Julia's mattress, Julia is resurrected, in the same way Frank was during the first film, and proceeds to murder the mental patient, draining him of his fluids and giving Julia back a bit of her strength. Julia and Channard form a relationship, and, in exchange for the doctor helping her regenerate, by bringing her fresh victims, in the same way she did for Frank, she would show Channard what he truly wished to see, promising to take him into hell itself, finally fulfilling his greatest desires. Channard begins surreptitiously bringing more mentally ill patients to his home for Julia to feed on, soon returning Julia to her almost fully restored physical form. Since Channard's end of the bargain had been fulfilled, it was time for Julia to fulfill hers. Meanwhile, back at the hospital, Channard's assistant, Kyle McRae, approaches Kirsty, informing her that he now believes her story. He reveals to her that he was in hiding at Channard's residence while trying to investigate the doctor's suspicious behavior regarding the mattress, and, when Julia was resurrected, witnessed the horrifying events that followed. He tells her that he is now fully on board with the idea of helping her. When Kirsty and Kyle arrive at Dr. Channard's home, Kyle heads to the attic and discovers the grisly remains of several corpses. Julia, her skin almost completely regenerated, appears before Kyle, briefly luring him into a false sense of security, only to inevitably kill him, consuming his essence and completing the last stretch of her regeneration. Kirsty, after investigating Channard's office and finding not only the puzzle boxes but a peculiar photo she believes to be the human version of Pinhead, she hears the commotion upstairs, pockets the photograph, and rushes up to the attic. Enraged at what she sees, she attempts to attack Julia, but is knocked unconscious by her former stepmother. Before anything else can transpire, Channard abruptly returns home, now accompanied by Tiffany, a young, mute, girl, who has been under his care at the Institute for quite some time. Tiffany, who is a master of puzzles, is tasked with solving one of Channard's lament configurations, which Julia has already revealed to Channard to be gateways to hell itself. Not knowing about the usual repercussions of opening the lament configuration, Tiffany begins her attempts to solve the puzzle box, with Julia and Channard hidden in a back hallway, watching Tiffany from afar. Soon thereafter, Tiffany solves the puzzle box, and the corridors of hell, begin to open from within the room, ethereally materializing from nowhere, 
and very much to the surprise and delight of Channer. Slowly, but surely, the order of the gash emerges from the doorways, encircling Tiffany. Expectedly, the Cenobites attempt to move on her, with the female Cenobite leading the way. However, as Pinhead comes through the corridor, he quickly stops this attack before anything can be done to Tiffany. Judging by Pinhead's response to Tiffany's opening of the box, it is learned that opening the lament configuration does not in and of itself justify being targeted by the Cenobites. When the female Cenobite questions Pinhead's instruction, he states that it is not hands that call us, but desire, indirectly revealing that Channard's desire to know about Hell led him to use Tiffany to open the box, therefore rendering him the true target of the order. Upon glancing up at the hidden hallway, where Julia and Channard had been watching the events unfold, Pinhead sees that it is now vacant, knowing then that the two had managed to sneak into Hell's Labyrinth through one of the opened, ethereal doorways. After Kirsty reawakens and enters Channard's office, she finds the puzzled box, and frantically attempts to return it to its original state. She is almost immediately confronted by the Cenobites, with Pinhead taking the opportunity to reconfigure the box and lock open the doorways to the labyrinth. The Order of the Gash is eager to take Kirsty to the labyrinth, and openly toy with and mock her when she explains that she didn't open the box, yet was intent on finding the trapped soul of her father in hell. Pinhead then allows Kirsty to flee into the halls of the labyrinth, telling her that she has free reign to explore hell, but that she can expect to inevitably be captured and tortured at some point in the near future. Channard and Julia enter the labyrinth of hell, a dark dominion governed by the god known as Leviathan, who dwells in the shape of a gigantic, elongated diamond rotating in the sky above the labyrinth, and emanating black beams, which make those who fall afoul of them surge with the memories of the atrocities they've committed in life, making them feel the pain they've inflicted on others, to heightened and extreme degrees that are never fully explained or explored. After encountering these black beams of light himself, Channard is hit with a barrage of dark memories from his own past, and is left exhausted by the experience, and calling out to Julia for help. After explaining to Channard that the Leviathan is the god of flesh, hunger, and desire, the lord of the labyrinth, and the god she serves both in hell and on earth, she reveals to the doctor that she was tasked with the mission of bringing souls to Leviathan upon her return to the world of the living, and that one of the reasons she was allowed to even make said return, was because she agreed to these conditions, not just because blood was spilt on the mattress, leading to the belief that there are stipulations and conditions to the typical resurrection seen in the Hellraiser universe, and not exclusive to the aforementioned reasonings. What is not made clear about Julia's deal with Leviathan, is whether Pinhead and the Order of the Gash are aware of this agreement, we never see an encounter between Julia and the Cenobites in the vein of Frank's encounter with them in the first film, so it is not known whether the Gash would have been enraged or accepting regarding Julia's resurrection and return to the labyrinth as a free-roaming entity. It can be assumed that, since Pinhead is such a devoted acolyte of the Leviathan, the Order of the Gash, and Hell itself, Pinhead would have respected and embraced the wishes of the Lord of Flesh, regardless of his own thoughts on the matter, or those of his Cenobite colleagues. Unlike Frank's earlier escape, Julia's deal with Leviathan would trump any kind of vengeful retrieval of her soul by the hands of the Gash. What is also unknown, is whether the Cenobites were actively searching for Channard within the labyrinth, since it was his desire that called them to Earth in the first place. After explaining the Leviathan and her dealings with the Dark Being, Julia betrays Channard, gifting his soul to the Leviathan as directed, for the Doctor was specifically requested by the God of Flesh. As a large creation chamber rises from the void beside the labyrinth, Channard is corralled into the chamber by Julia, as ethereal appendages of Leviathan begin aggressively and painfully transforming the Doctor into a Cenobite. It is unclear whether Pinhead was aware that the Leviathan was actively seeking out the Doctor in an effort to create a new Cenobite. It is completely possible that the Hell Priest was completely unaware of these obscure plans altogether, for whatever reason. Kirsty ventures into the bowels of the labyrinth, and soon encounters Frank Cotton within the chambers of his personal Hell. He reveals to her that his punishment in Hell is to be eternally teased and seduced by writhing female figures on beds, depriving him of any pleasure. 
It is unclear whether this was his previous hell before being resurrected during the events of the first film, or if this is a newly created punishment that Pinhead and the Gash created upon his return to the labyrinth. Frank also reveals to Kirsty that he in fact tricked her into coming to hell, as he was the bloodied figure appearing to her earlier, pretending to be her father in order to lure her and use her for his own pleasures for all eternity. At this point, Julia appears, making simple conversation with Frank before abruptly ripping out his heart in revenge for betraying and killing her previously. Whether or not Frank's spirit would eventually rematerialize in the same hellish cell, or fall to the deeper bowels of the labyrinth, is unknown. As Julia relishes in her actions, Kirsty flees the cell with Tiffany. After a vortex suddenly opens up in the walls of one of the hallways, Julia attempts to attack Tiffany and Kirsty, but ends up having her skin ripped away from her as she is sucked into the void, screaming in peril, and never to return. It is unclear where she went, why the vortex opened in the first place, or if this was the direct result of Leviathan's will. After returning to the institution through the still open doorways, Kirsty and Tiffany quickly fall afoul of Dr. Channard, now fully transformed into a Cenobite and very much under the direct control of the Leviathan, via a biological connection drilled into the top of his skull. As Channard attacks the patients of the hospital, Kirsty and Tiffany flee back into the still open doorways that lead to hell, noting that the box must be solved in order to close back the gates between the two worlds. They end up encountering Pinhead and the Order of the Gash shortly after re-entering the labyrinth, with the Hell Priest now intent on taking Kirsty's soul and making her a permanent resident of Hell. Kirsty then presents Pinhead with the photograph she took from Channard's home, and after at first denying that he's ever been anything but a member of the Order, gradually remembers that he was in fact once human. The other Cenobites also remember that they were once humans. This moment of revelation is cut short when Channard appears. The Order of the Gash do not seem to know who the Channard Cenobite is, and they do not behave in a way that suggests they are aware that Leviathan has personally connected himself to the Hellish Doctor. This is perhaps due to the fact that, after being awoken to their former lives as humans, the entire focus of the Order of the Gash has been displaced from their focus on serving Leviathan and are in a transitional period of reconnecting with the cores of their former selves, rather than the Cenobites they had lived as, up until this point. In an act of rebellion against Leviathan and Hell itself, and one that sees the Gash attempting to protect Kirsty and Tiffany, Pinhead moves on Channard, hooking him with numerous chains and attempting to maintain control of the situation. Unfortunately, Channard ends up breaking free, stating that he is now taking over the operation, and quickly dispatches the order, with their forms reverting to their original, human versions as they perish. It is not known if Channard and the Leviathan made the decision to destroy the Order of the Gash before or after Kirsty showed them their former origins as humans, or if it was simply a decision made on a whim when Pinhead stepped in to protect Kirsty and Tiffany, therefore disobeying the will of Leviathan in an instant. Before dispatching Pinhead, the powers of Leviathan revert him back to his former self, Elliot Spencer, who smiles at Kirsty thankful for what she's done to free him, and silently signaling her to flee. Kirsty and Tiffany leave the chamber, and Elliot Spencer is quickly killed by the Channard Cenobite, who calls out in a disturbing howl of victory upon the full destruction of the Order. This, of course, would not be the true end of Pinhead. After a final chase that concludes atop the labyrinth, with the God of Flesh overlooking, Kirsty tricks Channard by donning Julia's skin, giving Tiffany the opportunity to finish the lament configuration, finally destroying Dr. Channard as the Leviathan abandons the Doctor and withdraws its ethereal, tentacular appendage from his body, ripping his head off in the process. The completion of the box alters Leviathan into the shape of a lament configuration, closing the gate between the two worlds as Tiffany and Kirsty barely escape the confines of the labyrinth. It is not known whether Leviathan has been permanently conquered at this point, but it can be assumed that his indisposition is merely temporary, as he is, after all, the lord of the labyrinth, the god of flesh, hunger, desire, and of hell itself, and may in fact be, the tangible form of what biblical accounts describe as the fallen angel himself. Some time later when movers are in the process of removing the personal belongings of Channard within the doctor's home, 
One of them comes across the blood-stained mattress on the floor, for whatever reason left behind by authorities after the crime scene had been cleared and the bodies from the attic removed. As he bends down to examine it, two skinless arms reach out from the pool of blood, pulling him halfway into the mattress. When the second mover finally enters and observes the scene, a large spinning pillar, known as the Pillar of Souls, not dissimilar to the one seen whenever Cenobites appear, rises from the bloodied mattress, decorated with several Cenobite faces, including that of pinheads, it seems the Hell Priest may not have been entirely destroyed after all. The arms that pulled the man into the bed, have never been confirmed to be those of pinheads, someone else entirely, or simply two detached ethereal arms that simply coincide with the materialization of the Pillar of Souls itself. As the pillar stops spinning, it stops on the disembodied face of a vagrant called Little John, a guardian of the Lament configuration who was last seen in first film. He asks of the man, what is your pleasure, indicating that the cycle of temptation, pleasure, pain and suffering will continue, regardless of which specific Cenobites populate hell, and one can assume that the Leviathan is still very much in control of his domain. Like many other mysterious aspects of the Hellraiser mythos, it is not known what causes the Pillar of Souls to appear in the first place, or why the man was pulled into the mattress, since no blood was spilled onto its surface. It has been speculated that, since the Pillar of Souls features heavily in Hellraiser 3, albeit visually transformed, the very emergence of the Pillar is guided by some kind of otherworldly agenda that is assiduously carving a path for Pinhead's eventual return using Julia's mattress as a cabalistic conduit, from the realm of hell, to the world of the living. This concludes this episode of exploring the Hellraiser franchise, Pinhead, A Character History, Part 2, will cover the films, Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, and, Hellraiser, Bloodline, thank you for watching.